22 open. I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies, they have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Then I pray to you, Lord. I say, you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. Would you stand as you're able, please, and join us in song? <laughs>
in many ways that song talks about what I am going to talk about today with the passages of scripture that we are going to open up and look at. <clears throat> it talks about the upside down nature of the kingdom of God. We've been talking about the kingdom of God for a long time and now, and that is not the first time that you have heard me refer to the upside down nature of the kingdom of God, meaning that basically in broad terms, it is different, pretty much the opposite of our broken natures and our broken kingdoms that we create. It is his perfect nature and the perfect kingdom that he creates. We've talked about the fact that the gospel is not so much that we figured out a way to get up to heaven, but the gospel is about God coming to earth and opening the kingdom of God on earth now. We've talked a lot about how the kingdom of God is now and is yet to come. In this in-between time, with the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit and his New Testament church, we have the kingdom of God now. We as Christians, just as the Hebrews before us, look forward to the second coming of Christ. And so the process will fully complete itself. We talk again, this is review, for those of you who haven't been here. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> the, from Eden to Eden. The Edenic state is the perfect state of physical and spiritual combined. And that's the way it was in the beginning when God and man could literally walk together in the garden. God in the presence, Adam, human, in the presence of man. Because before the fall, it was that perfect combination as God intends to be of his nature, of his likeness and image. We understand that there is a break in that plan, and we understand that throughout the course of human history, God has moved human history in the direction of the opportunity for the salvation of mankind. And we as Christians, we look at the history of humankind really as what we call the salvific history. And we can look around at 7.6 or 7.8 billion people in the world and say, well, why now are they all not Christians? Because the church has not fulfilled its purpose. One point. And two points, as we understand the second point, not all, are, not all are going to become Christians. Not all will follow the Christ. We understand that quite clearly from Scripture as well. So we look at all of that and we place ourselves, praise God, in the kingdom of God. And that means everything from the individual and your individual behavior and your individual context to your family context to the place where you are at work, the way that you carry on your business. And I don't mean just your behaviors. I mean for many of you, literally, your professions, your business, all of it reflects God's will on earth. Not just God's will for you, because God's will for you can be summed up as we have summed it up. God's will for you on earth is to do his will on earth. That is where we are really harped on that point, haven't I? That's the point of discernment that twists scripture to meet the needs of man instead of fulfilling the will of God on earth, the power of God is available to you so that you may fill in the blank. You may. God's will for you on earth. God's plan for you. One of those sorts of things. Not that he's unaware. Not that there isn't a plan. But at the core and the essence of the faith of the Christian is the submission 
to the will of God. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's will for you on earth is to do his will. And that's where, so that, you talk about 7.8 billion people, why aren't they all Christians? Because that's where a lot of people get off the boat. No, thank you very much. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that looks like in the future. I certainly cannot leave my this, that, and the other thing, and my money, and my retirement, and my power, and my position, and my whatever. I'm like, oh, I can't do that. And then we begin to reason away everything. Well, God gave me a brain. God gave me free will. God gave me... And we can do anything that we want because we take the scripture, we twist it around, and look, all of a sudden, it fits exactly what I need. It's amazing. It's actually a word for that. It's called eisegesis. It's when you put yourself into God's plan and say, you know what, it's really not all about God. It's really all about me. How can I figure this out? So we, you know, that, that's why, again, you, you look at the preaching and the purpose of preaching is to tell the truth about that, understanding that there are going to be a large portion, if not the majority of people, that are going to say, no thanks. Because of the very broken natures that are the cause of the need for Christ. See how that works? That's a vicious cycle leading to hell. The grace of the Lord, which we are about to explore, is the only power, and it's given to us by him, from him, that can break that cycle. So to understand the parable of the workers in the vineyard, because it begins with the word for, we need to go back just a little bit, and, and if you guys don't know, I'm just going to pre, do a little precursory action of Matthew 19. I don't know, maybe, maybe. But if you have a for or a therefore in Scripture, then you, you really do have to read what's in front of it. Because I can't, you know, just start something with therefore. It'll leave you want, like, what do you mean, therefore? You didn't say anything. Does that make sense? So here we are. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. And there are so many points to be made here, and I'm going to really do my best to focus on one. Bill's laughing right now. But I will. I will do my very best to focus on one. But we need to read the very end of 19 so that we understand what that four is about. So I'm going to start with verse 16 in Matthew chapter 19. If you're there, that's great. If you're not, just listen. It's fine. The guy's over there. Maybe it's cool. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Peter answered him, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake 
will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first, for the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, I, they were probably putting that up there, and I don't, this is a, what's called a, I'm just going to be completely transparent here, it's like I read from the New International Version. This is what's called a side-by-side. -side. It has four different translations in the same Bible. And normally we read, we'll read in church from the New Living Translation, and I just went to the New International Version. That's why it probably didn't match up. So there you go. Don't think that <laughs> there's something freaky happening. It was my mistake. Par usual. But you can see what the four is there for now. Because he's explaining to his disciples about the kingdom of God. And we can see, before we get into the next passage, the frame that he is creating and has been creating all throughout the chapters leading up to this about the upside-down nature of the kingdom of God. Because in the society of the day, to be first was everything. The order of things was you were first. You were first born. You were first in line. You were first among the Pharisees. You were first to receive your wages, which we're going to read about. You know, when it's the first, you did, you performed, you outperformed. You were born at the right time. You were born into the right family. You were first. Everything about it was very, very cultural to be the first. You're going to, you're going to hear that disciples are going to argue about who's going to be first in line with you. Who's going to be able to sit with you. Those sorts of things. And so that really lends impact to the understanding when he flips everything upside down and says, you know, the least of these will be the first in the kingdom of heaven. When we talk about what we're going to read, we talk about the least will be first and the first will, the last will be first and the first will be last and all of those things. So he talks about you know, the story of the rich young ruler, which we could go over and over and over, and it's been, you know, argued and debated and all of those different things. God, you know, Jesus never says you can't get into heaven. That whole thing is about making an idol of the possessions that you do have, making an idol out of the money that you do have, and the willingness to release those idols, right? To burn that as your pole, right? To give up that temple to Baal and follow Jesus. That's what that's all about. His treasures were here on earth, right? So he's not saying you can't get into heaven. He's talking about the upside down nature of the kingdom of God, which means because you're rich, you don't automatically get into heaven. Because you're rich and you've demonstrated to the rest of the world, he doesn't care how many people you've done, that you've built the greatest empire in the face of the planet, you've built the greatest industry in the face of the planet, you've done all the greatest business on the face of the that doesn't matter. If it's an idol, it's an idol. And you're following it. It, not him. That's what that's about. And when, so we learn that he's turning things upside down and he wants to explain further and he's even going to give an object lesson because he knows how dense we can be. So he says, I'll read in the New Living Translation now, guys. We'll get everything all squared away here. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and send them out to work. At 9 o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace. He saw some more people standing around doing nothing, so he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard at noon, and again at 3 o'clock, he did the same thing. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. 
Now that is hugely important to understand the context, the power of this passage and this teaching. Based on what I just shared with you, if you were last at anything, right? If you were the last to be hired, if you were the, that mattered. The order in which things happened and the order in which you presented to your culture, to your society, was super important. So those people who were paid first, they were the prestigious workers of the day. They were day workers, to be sure, but they were the ones. They should be paid first. Look at me. I am the one who is here first. It is to understand this is to understand how hugely important it is when Jesus makes that move and turns everything upside down. We read through it very quickly, but it's one of those sentences where we stop all the time. And, say, and the Hebrew mind and the New Testament, the New Christians of reading this, all of the they brought them in, brought the, the last ones in first. That doesn't make any sense. Well, there's a lot about the kingdom of God that doesn't make any human sense. We know that. So he's turning it. Automatically, he's turning everything on its ear. And automatically, all of those day workers are all perked up. But they figured, hey, what, you know, they're still only going to get a pittance compared to what I'm going to get. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. That would have upset people enough right there. When those hired at 5 o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner, those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. And he answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. Again, there are a lot of different directions and ways that, you know, points, of preaching points, as we say, that we can draw from this scripture. We can talk about the economy of God. And that's where I said I would refer to the church town monthly. If you read on that, there's one little statement when I outline some of the giving that we have been able to do since the resurgence of this church. And that one little line simply says, we have never given more. We have never had more. That's God's economy. It also happens to be one of the biblical concepts that, like prosperity preachers, will take and twist. The more you give, the more you get. But again, we're going to talk about the judgment of the heart and the way that Jesus did, you know, that sort of thing. But we can talk about God's economy in that way. We can talk about leadership. The first will be last, and the last will be first, and servant leadership, and all of those things. But naturally, being me, being me, I'm going to talk about the one that really upsets people the most. And that is the grace of God. The grace of God, the doctrine of love, the doctrine of grace, is a touchstone for human, or for, for Christian dissension. And part of the reason why is this. Because always when we talk about the doctrine of grace, we are willing to open ourselves up to that and say, yes, thank you, Lord Jesus. Why? Because in our selfishness, we believe that we deserve it. I've done well. I've given myself to Christ. I follow in the church, that sort of thing. 
I come up and sing before church. No, I'm just kidding. That's not a good thing. <laughs> and, and maybe, you know, there's Angel. I think, she, I think the world with her, she probably deserves it too. But that person, they don't deserve it. And see, that's where the dissension is. It's like when we talk about the doctrine of love. And we talk about the myriad of definitions of love that the world has. Most of them involve desire and lust and all of those different sorts of things. There is one definition of love, and it is God's agape love. We are incapable of that at this time. But it is the standard of truth upon which all other love is judged. Grace is the standard of selflessness upon which all other selflessness is judged. Moreover, grace is the standard of forgiveness. And this is what really gets people turned in the knob. Because grace is the standard of forgiveness upon which all other forgiveness is judged. So we bring this up, and, and I've done Bible studies on this and talks and sermons, and of course, people, you know, they ask the, the, the normal questions. So what you're saying is that somebody can come to Christ, accept Christ as their Savior and their Lord the moment before they die, and they will be forgiven, and they will be with him in eternity, in the age to come. And the only appropriate theological response to that is yes. Well, here's, this, is, this happens eight out of ten times. And you, some of you have had this discussion. You're telling me that an Adolf Hitler, on his death, that repented and accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior and his Lord, that he would receive eternal life in the age to come. And the only appropriate theological response is if it is judged, right? That's between, right? He, Jesus Christ is the judge of the heart. If it is authentic, if it is repentance, and it is judged by God that way, yes, is the answer. There, you got another billion people off the boat. That's not fair. <laughs> and the only response I have to you is, so what? It's not for you to decide. It's his money You've got a problem with the way that he spends it, according to the analogy? <laughs> if you've got a problem with the way he spends his money, that's a you problem, not a him problem. And that's the way we have to look at these scriptures. The definition of who God is and how God chooses to behave and the standards, the definitions that he gives us for grace, for love, for forgiveness are not ours for fairness. Everybody, it's not fair. For justice, all of those things are God's definitions, not ours. And that's what, that, what I, I can't, I cannot give myself over to a God who would forgive Adolf Hitler. Then don't. I mean, I want you to. Don't get me wrong. I want you to. But I can't present any other God to you. I can't take who God is and say, well, let's just take the edges off of that a little bit. I mean, the only edge that can be taken, and the same is true whether it's Adolf Hitler as our example today, or Brian Warner. If my repentance is not authentic and judged by Christ to be so, I'm not going to be living in eternity with him either. The same standard is applied across the board for every 7.8 billion human beings. So you can't play that game. Well, if that's the way this whole thing works, I'm going to go live like hell and hopefully I'll have a chance at the end to say, hey, I accepted Jesus, mm -hmm. right? You see that train coming down that tunnel, I accepted Jesus. It needs to be judged by Jesus to be authentic repentance 
and submission to his will. And that could last for five minutes, or it could last for 75 years if you come to Christ as a child. That's not your call. And who he chooses to forgive and how that comes about is not your call. And that standard of fairness that we have is not his. And the standard of justice that we have is not his. And the standard of grace, what we choose, is not his. And the standard of forgiveness, this is the one, right? Because even grace seems a little bit out there. Grace is out there. A little bit of the grace of God. I can show you grace. Y'all, you, you did something that was rude or whatever. I'll share, I'll show grace. Could you share a little, have a little grace with me? That sort of thing. But we're talking about God's forgiveness and his standard of forgiveness and the command that he makes that if you cannot forgive others as God has forgiven you, you will not be with him in the kingdom to come. That's the word. Take another billion people, get them off the boat, right? To follow through with my, what I've been saying. These are the realities of walking with Christ. His ways are not our ways. His mind is not our mind. His standard of behavior, if you want to call it that, is not ours. The way that he exemplifies, we, we don't even say that he administers, he is justice, he is grace, he is agape love, he is forgiveness. He is these things. These are absolute truths, absolute definitions upon which we create our own or we base our own. And let, me, let me say, let me put it this way. Those are the absolute truths and the absolute definitions upon which those outside of the kingdom of God create their own definitions. And we, inside the kingdom of God, try to base our definitions. Does that, does that, does that make it, see the difference there? We're not going to get it right either, all of the time. But we recognize those absolute truths. We see the hard truth of forgiveness. And that is how we try to base our own forgiving behavior. We see this attitude of this grace, undeserved, unmerited favor of God to be forgiven by God and drawn into relationship with him through Jesus Christ. We see that grace, and again, outside of the kingdom of God, you create your own sort of ideas about, right? If you, you want respect, you better give respect. No, I'm not, so not going to poo-poo that. That's a, that's a, it, when applied, when applied consistently and with grace, that's a good way to help mold and shape a human being. And perhaps inside the kingdom of God, that's the way we think of those things. But if we're going to be in Christian relationship, if we're going to be in a relationship with the Holy God, and he, you know, and he says... Hey, if you want me to forgive you, you forgive me. What? There's nothing to forgive. If you want grace from me, then you show me grace. I don't understand that. How I don't show you grace. You are grace. If you want my respect, you respect me first. That's not how it worked. When we were defacing the Christ. And when we were humiliating him on that cross, he takes the ideas that we have as broken human beings and he tries to bring us as we are brought into the kingdom of God. He gets us to look at them in different ways. He says, I know 
Outside of the kingdom of God, you have these ideas about grace and forgiveness and respect and justice and mercy and, and goodness. I know outside there, there are a billion definitions of these, but inside the kingdom of God, these are the definitions of grace and goodness and love and mercy and respect. These are the standards. These are the absolute truths. And by the power of God's Holy Spirit, we will move toward more of that and less of this. There is a difference in the attitude and behavior of the Christian because we have absolute truths upon which we base our own behavior. Some of them, as I've mentioned, have gotten billions of people out of the church because they will not have that. They will not live, they will not even accept, not live by, they will not even accept the way God is and the undeserved grace that he would demonstrate to the most evil and vilest of persons that you can think of if their repentance is true. We talk about forgiveness, and I have this conversation regularly because people are hurt by people on a regular basis. And we're talking about emotional hurt, physical hurt, sexual abuse, all of these different things, all of the most vile things that you can think that one person can do to another person. I want to say I've heard it all, but... but I cannot tell you that that person does not deserve forgiveness because we are commanded to forgive as we have been forgiven. Those are some of the hardest conversations that I have. Because I can't say, it's okay. Set that person off into a separate category of those who are unforgivable. You don't forgive them, God won't forgive them. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. That's the way it works in your mind, and I'm teaching you falsely. Now, it, it, don't get me wrong. It's not just black and white, cut and dry. You forgive and just walk on with your lives. There's a lot to it. And forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation. Forgiveness does not have to be a two-way street. What did I just say? The Lord commands us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Does that mean that we forgive him? I mean, he, he, forgiveness is not a two-way street with the Lord. He looks at what we do and how we are and the wicked ways in which we behave, and he forgives. I don't need to forgive him back. So we have lots of really, we understand the ideas so that's a, that's a very touchy thing. So I want to take just a little bit of time and explain that. That I'm not just throwing a Bible at you saying, forgive that person or go to hell. You understand. That, but I also, at the same time, cannot tell you to not forgive. So we've got to walk together in Scripture and figure out what that looks like. This example is an example of the upside downness of the kingdom. If you're continuing to read that book, that's one of the upside downness of the kingdom. Because until that point, right, until the fulfillment of the law comes, people were some sometimes doing their best as they looked at the law and tried to do those sorts of things, but for the most part, not. But now the fulfillment of the law has become incarnate on earth. We see, we have experienced the standard. We know the absolute truths. And as we are adopted into the kingdom of God, we accept these truths. We accept who God is. 
We accept the hard realities of what he teaches us as his children. We base our everyday behavior off of the standards, the absolutes that he defines. We don't get to make it up as we go along. We don't get to recreate God in our image. We don't get all of that eisegesis where we put ourselves into the story and say, well, if I were that landowner, you don't get to do that. Or if I were that person in the, that, that start worked all day long, I would have demanded, go for it. You can, you can stand here in the middle of the sanctuary and demand all you want from God. Feel free. <laughs> Your unacceptance of who God is and all of his attributes and facets your unacceptance of that is a you problem, not a him problem. He is who he is. I am who I am. And he is the same yesterday, today, as he will be tomorrow. And those are the facts. And so coming to terms with God's grace is important. Coming to terms, and what that looks like in your own life personally, and how, by the power of God alone, you extend that to other people and live that way. Coming to terms with God's forgiveness, that's the real dial turner. Coming to terms with God's forgiveness is something that we must come to terms with. And how, by the power of God alone, that manifests itself in your life. And how it presents to those outside of the kingdom of God. Coming to terms with the definition of God's love and sacrifice. Coming to terms with God's call as you are in the kingdom of God. Filled with God's Holy Spirit. Coming to terms with the very base basic cornerstone idea that all of this is done, all of this is done so that his will may be fulfilled on earth, not yours. I mean, that's an everyday thing. And you know that I'm the first one to look in the mirror and hold my hand up. That's an everyday thing for a broken human being. Let your will be done. I know what I want. The fact that I don't get it is a me problem, not a him problem. I know what I would like to see socially, politically, economically, in the church, all the, whatever, any facet of life that you can possibly think of, I know what I would like to see. But the fact that I don't get it Is not a him problem. And we talked last week that that can go to some very deeply personal situations. The brokenness of relationship, the deepness of grief, the idea of I have been, you know, this is. This is a common pastoral conversation. Brian, I have I've given my life to Jesus. I have served him X number of years. I truly do. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and he or she still died. What's the point? Those are hard things to come to terms with as a Christian. That it's not the power of God so that your will can be done. It's the power of God so that his will can be done. And that all things are not made known to us now, but all things will be made known to us in the age to come. 
It's called faith. And I can't preach anything else. Because in those hardest moments, it's either it's you and it's him. And you can choose. You can choose. I trust you, Lord. Or I'm getting off the boat. That's the reality of it. So we read that, and I would encourage you to read through 19 and 20. We talk about, well, I, I won't go, in, but fine. I bet you've heard the preaching today. You've heard the realities of the truth. Go and read 18, 19, 20, and into 21, and you'll start picking apart all of the examples and even all of the object lessons that God is giving about this. The first will be last, the last will be first. The economy of God, the forgiveness and the grace of God, all of the definitions that are who he is that we now begin, we understand, and as followers of God through Jesus Christ, we begin to base our way of being by the power of God. We begin to base our way of being on that instead of all of this other junk over here and all of these other idols over here and all of this other blah, blah. Inside the kingdom of God, now let's talk about truth. Let's talk about grace. Let's talk about love. Let's talk about forgiveness. God's definition of those things and walking in them. See the difference? Out there, you can make it up as you go along. In here, you don't get to make it up as you go along. You just don't. I usually say something at this point in time like, so suck it up, cupcake, and deal with it. Right? If I were in front of a football team right now, I'd, you don't get to choose your opponent. And you, you know, that's one of the things. So suck it up and get back out there. Christians, suck it up and get back out there. Because it's, it's not your will to be done on earth. It's his will to be done on earth. It is actually what you signed up for when you repented and gave your life to Christ. And to be taught anything else is false. So, suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> You know how many times I tell myself in the course of the week, you know, like, hey, get your head out from where it doesn't belong, suck it up, and go do your job. And that's my dad talking without all the swear words. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great life advice. In the kingdom of God, it's great life advice. Because I trust him. Ultimately, I trust him with my life. All right. We are going to transition into a time of prayer. Um, if I can get my head on straight here to play this song, How Great Is Our God, I think maybe we won't. Because maybe I don't have the music. Has anyone seen it? <laughs> uh, Mackenzie, if you have any M&Ms, I can use a couple right now. I did have it this morning because I printed it out. I have, if you're happy and you know it, that's for the church picnic next week. All right. You know what I think maybe I did? Did Declan go out to look for it? Yes. Thank you so much. Maybe I put it in the keys.
know that whole, you know, extending grace thing that I talked about? I was just expecting that. We'll yeah. show you grace and so, forgive you. <laughs> boom! I put it in with all of the lyrics to the other songs, so, or to the lyrics. Oh. So as we transition, we'll take a time today um, to share our testimonies with one with the other. Um, I really, really would encourage you all to stay and care for one another in that way. Um, but we will see how that goes. But we will transition into that time with this song, which I definitely need to get practiced up for. Some people in the sanctuary know why. Oh, yeah. I'm playing it at a wedding in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 